an editor so he is giving me instruction uh through the mm -hmm. youtube live stream here how to actually edit a thing normally i can just show up and uh and ch and talk which is uh what i'm actually decent at so all right okay um all right hello and welcome to crack and krakoa number 100 i'm dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com i am joined today by open mike eagle rapper podcaster uh performer extraordinaire and uh and huge x-men fan as many yep. of you may not know uh, despite the fact that on uh, <clears throat> brick body kids still daydream uh legendary iron hood is is yeah. definitely a hardcore x-men uh rap i, it, I remember it really is that. i dig that album a lot and i remember hitting that song and being like oh this is like sometimes a lot of times like hip-hop will drop in comics references right that's kind of a mm -hmm. there's a definite like fandom and part of the medium there um but it, when you rap that song i'm like oh this is like straight up like an issue this is like a it really is issue yeah it really is and it is funny um i toyed with the idea of like calling it that like something that made it obvious but i was like nah this is this is for my real x-men heads right here <laughs> nice yeah i love it yeah no it's good because it's, it's not too obvious but if you know you know um, mm -hmm. All right, so today on Cracking Krakoa 100, we are going to talk all things uh, X-Men. We're going to answer listener questions that came in ahead of time. If you have questions on the live stream, again, uh, definitely shout them out, and we will try to respond to as many as we can, although I think like definitely we've had a lot of questions congregating around the same sorts of topics. So I appreciate that to everybody who sent them in as well. Uh, Mike, how, how caught up are you on ten of swords have you ever read everything that come out yeah I, I <laughs> you know the funny thing for me is i've read every issue uh in the dawn of x yeah like every everything so and i read every, every, every series all that yeah right um so I'm, I'm super caught up i'm like beyond caught up like i've read all sorts of stuff i feel like i didn't even have to read just because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's been out in the line nice nice very cool all right, then this should be no problem for you. Um, so the the first question we had, and I will say too, this is a, um, it's definitely going to have spoilers. So we're going to talk X Men, we're going to talk Ten of Swords, and like it's it's kind of hard to talk about what's going on without getting into spoilers. Same goes for the the theories, mm -hmm. right? So like as we as we talk, you know, about this, if you are not caught up and you're worried about that. Um, I will caution you, there may be some spoilery type material as we talk, okay? That said, let's get into, all right, in Ten of Swords, we have Krakoan sword bearers, and they're, they're in a tournament against the Arako side, right? So we have Krakoa on Earth, we have Arako below in this sort of hellish dimension, and there's going to be a tournament, and we have these sword bearers. Now, a lot of people have been asking for theories and ideas about, we have 10 Krakoan sword bearers, who is going to die? Who mm -hmm. is going to be the one to get it? Because the big reveal in X Factor number two, which is chapter two of this event, was that if somebody dies in Otherworld, which is where this tournament will take place, that they cannot be resurrected via the Krakoan resurrection protocols, which are all a whack. They're all messed up right now. So, Mike, before mm. I go through the list, and I can do the, <clears throat> we can do it one by one, because I literally have everybody written out and ranked here. Do you have initial thoughts on who you think might get it? Who might have a a final death of sorts in Otherworld? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not very familiar with who each sword bearer is on their Krakoa side. I mean, right now we have Ilyana, we have Wolverine, um, we know Cable for sure, we know Storm for sure. Um, I think Cable's an interesting choice since yeah. there's already, uh, since growing up, Cable is still running around out there somewhere. Um, the question of how how much of a loss is it if Kid Cable dies is kind of interesting. Mm. Um, he seems like in some ways like a placeholder character anyway. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I'm not sure who the rest of this. I know Gorgon is is going to be one, um, and and he's one like you know I could see him possibly dying, but there's no stakes really in him right now. He hasn't really been dealt with much uh, except for his presence has been acknowledged there. Um, Yes, I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not really sure if there's a clear winner for me for who gets it uh, in other world. That's interesting because because I do think like Gorgon. You mentioned you know the the stakes thing is super important here because there are characters. I think Gorgon is one. I think Brian Braddock is another. Where right. you could take them out uh, easily 
but it wouldn't it wouldn't resonate. It wouldn't really have an impact. So for mm-hmm. the for those reasons, I have them ranked pretty low in terms of like impact and relevance. Yeah, I, I think like so if we go down the list, our Krakoan sword bearers are Wolverine, the Braddocks, Betsy and Brian, Gorgon, Storm, Magic, Doug Ramsey, Apocalypse, and Cable. Okay, I think let's go with Cable because you brought him up there. Cable's super interesting to me. Be- I have him ranked very low in terms of I so I, I did this on a one to five scale yesterday I did okay. one being uh, no chance five being RIP right like we'll we'll see you later it's been real um, and with cable we know he's in the sword space station right now um, but we also know he's in the sword series coming after this that's gonna be I written see. by Al Ewing I see. and uh, I think Valerio Shidi on art which I'm super pumped about it's gonna be the cosmic book we get Ewing in the X office which is awesome um, so the only wrench here for me, though, that, that makes me think this theory could be, there could be more to this, is uh, we know a lot's going to happen with Cyclops. He's going to make some decision here based on, like, solicits and the way, just like Hickman's focus on the character, that, mm-hmm. um, that he's going to make some decision that really changes things for him. Cable's his son. Some sort of sacrifice where he makes a call that leads to Cable getting trapped in another world or, or being killed or something, that, to me, makes Cable an interesting player. But somehow he is being teased on the sword number one and number two covers. So uh, that I makes see. those sense. those those solicits, man. They're trouble. Those solicits are trouble, man. <laughs> how how are we supposed to go into this blind, um, you know, not knowing what's supposed to happen mm-hmm. when they tell us who's going to be on the cover of comic books four months from now? Totally, totally. Yeah, solicits are super. I, 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 as a reader, I don't like ever checking out solicits because they spoil stuff you know yeah. like they, they tell you what's coming um but as i've been like you know pretending i i know things and like trying to realize <laughs> i'm like i have to look because it helps I'm, to have I'm the, in the dark. yeah for yeah, sure that makes sense. uh but it, it's a it's a dicey game i totally agree um all right so that's cable wolverine i think no chance i think he got his own death of event in 2014 he was brought back recently it took years to get him where it's like actual Wolverine in the comics, you know? We went through Old Man Logan. We went through all these other people. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any chance it's going to be Wolverine. Plus, he appeared to die in House of X number four. So right. like, for me... So they've already played that card with him in a way. Totally, totally. So yeah. I, I think he's safe. Um, Betsy Braddock is an interesting pick. I, I think given Teeny Howard's status as co-writer of this event... Um, She's had a major focus on Betsy as this new Captain Britain. Sacrificing herself would have some weight, you know, in Mm -hmm. the Excalibur series uh, because she's been a major player. My big concern there is, like, she just just got made um, Captain Britain. So to me, it's like, if you make her Captain Britain and then you immediately take her off the board, that's kind of not a great look and and kind of doesn't really explore the story there that you're trying to get into. Plus, the, the... Odds, the reason I think it might happen is, one, she drew Iska the Unbeaten as her I see. as her fighter. Her power is to never lose, <laughs> which is awesome. So she, she's so fighting someone who can't lose. And um, the theory that I have, my instant theory on this, is Saturnine. Omniversal Majestrix of Otherworld. She rules that land. She's cast some doubt. She's cast some shade on Betsy as new Captain Britain. She's like, you're tied to Krakoa. You're not the protector of Otherworld. I don't trust you. This event could be a measure, uh, a way of Betsy establishing that trust. She dies or sacrifices herself in Otherworld to save Otherworld. Mm. Saturnine now trusts her as Captain Britain, and she can resurrect people. <clears throat> Otherworld, Otherworld resurrects Captain Britons all the time. So I, that, to me, is is an interesting way this could play out, where um, where Betsy gets resurrected as an Otherworld protector. But but I you know by that same token I'm wondering if uh, since since Saturnine has this deep distrust of um, of Betsy that's gone back to to even the earliest um, instances of of Betsy being Captain Britain um, does she does does Saturnine engineer something within this event that causes Betsy to be killed to get her out of the way sure. Um, especially since I'm, and, and I, I wonder what's happened with this since, um, since the, the realities were split and then, you know, um, and then Gambit and Jubilee and, and everyone became a Captain Britain as well. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that ends up playing a part in this in any way. 
That's interesting. Yeah, because Saturnine, right? She doesn't trust Betsy, and we know Brian Braddock is going to be um, a, a player in this. And she loves. We know Saturnine loves Brian because he's been Captain Britain forever. Could she be working behind the scenes to get him instilled? Uh, I think that's a, a strong possibility. Plus, I, I think too, like I mentioned before, like it'd be super easy to take out Brian Braddock. But again, like it would just feel like a cop out. He died in the first arc of Excalibur. His brother Jamie's an Omega level reality warper. He brought him back immediately, um, and it, like basically, you know, he's it's already happened. It, it wouldn't have a lot of impact. My theory with Brian is that Jamie, the reality warper, and just like absolute, you know, chaos, um, brought him back as a mutant. So I think Brian's mm-hmm. actually a mutant now. He just doesn't know yet, and that like I think that's going to have some relevance here because otherwise he's fighting for Krakoa as like their only human ally right. that we know of. It doesn't quite have the same impact necessarily i think he'd be the only human in this entire event then if that was the point that, w- that would make sense yeah um all right cool so we got a super chat here thanks so much for the support uh i am getting a notification just to say that my mic is low <laughs> okay let me see what i can do um and and mike if you want to talk about any theories that you have as i do that um, whether it's about the death or if you want to take it a different angle, feel free. This is this is a freestyle. You can vamp. Well, you know, you know, it's funny. The the main idea that I found myself coming into this conversation with, um, me and my lady have been watching. We've been watching Lost, right? We've been sure. rewatching Lost. We're like into season four now, and it struck me how much um, Dawn of X is like Lost in that, you know, it's a bunch of people on an island. Um, a bunch of funny stuff is happening, and in a lot of ways, we are waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> we are always waiting for 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 answers to start happening. And and you know, um, more than a year into this now, I've almost found myself getting a little frustrated um, because you know, like when I have theories and things that I think that might happen, I'm off. I'm often reaching out to you to say, "Hey, I think this might be happening." Yeah. And the reason that um. I get excited like that. It's because I like things start to align where I think we're going to get an answer on something, and we really haven't gotten any answers in a really long time. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. um, I think the last answer we've gotten was like how the like Crucible was probably the last answer we got in terms of how they deal with resurrection um, of mutants who had like lost their powers and um, uh, and and after House of M and. Um, I think, you know, as a reader personally, I've been very invested because I love Hickman so much and I trust Hickman a lot. Um, but it, he's, I, I feel like I'm, my, my, my patience, my devotion is starting to be tested a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even, even in this event, like I'm enjoying this event, but like I'm reading, like when I read how Solemn was introduced, that, the way that character is introduced and is is talking about himself all the time and giving us all his characteristics and traits um, in a way that feels a little forced. I'm like, this does not feel like... Like, if this happened um, in uh, Avengers and New Avengers or, like, Secret Warriors or something, but it'd, be, it'd be a little more subtle. <laughs> it'd be a little mm. more massaged in. Maybe seeds for this new character would have been planted a little earlier. Um and it's just it's stuff like that that I'm starting to pick up on, and I'm and I'm and I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that he's being able to steer this ship as much as he wants to, because yeah. I think that's important in all of this. And I'm hoping that we start to um, we start to get some answers. So you know, I'm hoping we start to get some answers. Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, it's the the answers thing. Like, there's a serious test to the reader's patience throughout yeah. this this entire run especially with um you know house of x and powers of 10 delivered so many huge ideas mm-hmm. and it's so few of them have actually been delivered like you're saying right. you know like so there's so they're still out there and that's exciting but it's definitely putting readers patience to the test um yeah. i 100 agree i i do think there's one thing i take for granted is like having read the hickman experience from 2008 to 2016 I have a lot of trust and I have a lot of confidence as a a fan of that work that we will get there, you know? So it's like right. I'm kind of enjoying the ride to that point, but it's it's a huge ask and it's it's definitely not a small thing to say like, "Hey, stick with us for 2 years and one of them <laughs> might pay off." 
That's right. a lot of comics to invest in to get to, get to that answer. Um, so I, I totally hear you on that. I, I do think like this event needs to it needs to hit some big answers and changes and revelations, I think. And I, I do kind of expect that it's going to get there. And we'll talk a little bit about what we think the end game might be. Um, but I but I think like it's got to do big stuff. It can't just be a cool battle, even though that's fun, right. even though I'm enjoying that story. But it can't just be like this cool battle. And then at the end of the day, um, it's back know. to yeah status status Krakoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I, I think that would be kind of a bust. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, let's dig into. Um, I, I don't know how many of the rest of these characters. I, I don't want to go through all of them necessarily because I think mm-hmm, that would be mm-hmm. kind of tedious. But I do want to talk about the ones that I think will definitely have major outcomes. And uh, the first here is that uh, Doug Ramsey. So he's going to be a sword bearer, cipher. He's got Warlock as his sword in this event. And I think, so I've got him as a probably won't die, but definitely will change. Um, Oh, that's really interesting, right? Because if he changes, then the the mutant's relationship to Kokoa changes. Exactly, exactly. That's really interesting. Yeah, he's our only guy, he's our only mutant who can actually correspond with Krakoa, and I'm curious, like, I wonder if in his sword fight, you know, might he be up against um, an Arakan soldier who is the, their communicator with Arako, right? Can somebody on their side actually communicate? That would be cool as well. But where I think we're going is Doug's got some sort of scheme with Warlock and with Krakoa that nobody else knows. Like, Doug knows things that he's not sharing and that nobody else knows because he's the only one who actually can talk to and communicate with Krakoa. So, and then one thing we've seen, again, going back to the the sometimes obnoxious solicit spoilers, is um, New Mutants number 14, which is going to be the first issue written by Vita Ayala, which I'm super excited about that creative change. Uh, it's gonna it's got no Doug on the cover. It's got pointedly, oh. it's got Warlock, it's got no Doug. Okay, so that, that to me is a very small potential tease. And what I think is going to happen, I think Doug is going to merge with Krakoa. He's going to merge with the land in some way. Now, again, like we've seen in Moira's Ninth Life, one of Apocalypse's four horsemen in that future is a Krakoa with, like, the memories of Doug. Okay, so we've actually seen that done before. I kind of think that's what's going to happen here, where these two might come together as this sort of new entity, where we get, like, a walking... You know, Krakoa is the island that walks. Now we get Doug Krakoa, or whatever that combo anagram, you know, is going to be. And and anagram doesn't make sense there, but whatever that that thing is going to be, and it's going to be Doug and Krakoa merged as one. I think he's totally going to change because you kind of can't kill Doug Ramsey again. He was kind of the like the dead new mutant for so many decades mm. that it's just like it it's tired. It's been done, but you can make him something new. You can make him something else. So that's where I think he's going. Did he also die in Utopia too? I remember there was that battle with the Nimrods and and Bastion on Utopia in Second Coming. And- in second coming. Yeah. yeah, did he did he die or something happened to him in that one too? Something that felt pretty. I don't big. know that he was alive at that. I think he was still like a necrotia zombie. I thing see. From it, it's been long enough that I don't totally remember the specifics. Um, but yeah, I, I'm he's he's had it rough. Doug's had a mm. rough go, so I don't want him to die again. But I but I do think a change is coming for sure. Um, and the one tease that I always like to mention too is like back in House and Powers, there's a panel. Where Doug, it's when Professor X introduces him to Krakoa, and Doug touches one of the leaves on the island, and the island starts turning like techno organic. Yeah. Starts, or the not the island, the leaf, right? And there's it's a very short visual. It's a very small tease, but again, it's like okay, he's there's something here with all this talk of the phalanx and all this talk of techno organic virus, and Doug's connection to Krakoa. That's not an accident. And I, I right. wonder if that starts getting built here. I think it ties into what you're saying a moment ago, which is let's start actually building out what these um, what you know these teases. Let's start actually delivering, right? And I think yep. that's one that could get hit in this event. All right, my other, my, I think my favorite theory from just the the who's going to die thing is okay. In creation, Saturnine named all the swords on the Arako side and on the Krakoa side. And on the Krakoa side, we had essentially the way it's been laid out, and they have not been delivered, but we had nine swords, uh, or nine sword bearers, rather. There are ten swords named, but there are nine sword bearers because Gorgon has two of them, 
He's hogging God Killer and Grass Cutter, right? Mm. And my assumption is he's not going to share. <laughs> um, he likes to wield <laughs> two. He's a Hickman favorite. Hickman used those swords in Secret Warriors. So that leaves a potential 10th sword bearer. Now, if we look at the um, the Saturnine free comic book day cards, I don't know if you remember these, but uh, there's, she, she went through the tarot cards, right? She goes through the deck. And one of the ones that she goes through is there are 10 sword bearers listed. One of them looks a lot like Magneto wielding a sword. So people are theorizing that Magneto would be using like the Cerebro sword because that's right. teased in the pages of, of X-Force. We did not hear that named, though, by Saturn. Now, my theory here is what if Magneto actually is one of the tournament players in this event, as that card suggested, and if you have a death of Magneto story, that has mm. a huge impact. That ha That's actually the kind of thing that is like capital B, capital D, big deal. Oh, you're right. Landscape, right? Because all yeah. the other players, I'm like, I, I don't think they would take <laughs> out Storm and Wolverine, and everyone else is kind of tangential. Magneto would be a huge deal. Um, right. What do you think of that? What, I mean, because like, they, I don't want to see it happen. But what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't either. But I think that's probably that's probably why it'd be a big deal. You know, um, it's because we don't want to see it happen because Magneto finally has uh, achieved his lifelong dream of, of 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 mutants assuming a stance of like, um, you know, uh, nationalism and 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 you know superiority if they want to lean into that, and uh, and you have. All of the history of Magneto's relationship to the X-Men to play off of there and how Magneto is being trumpeted as a hero and a, like a, a legendary mythical uh, hero in, in these right, um, right. in these stories that we're reading on Krakoa. Uh, if he somehow becomes a martyr, um, I think that's a that's a really big deal. I think that's a it's a big deal. For Marvel, like the the Marvel Universe, uh, Earth six one six, and I think mm -hmm. it's a big deal for us as readers as well. Like that would be that'd be really epic if something happens to him. Yeah, totally. And, and I think like like you just said in that uh, it was an Empire X Men, or no, it was an Empire tie in in the pages of X Men, and they basically it's it's a eulogy, it's a it's a it's praise of Magneto, the hero of Krakoa, right? Um, but it's also like. You know, could that be like, could that almost be have happened in the future? Some people ask me, could that be like a post mortem, you know, yeah. analysis of, hey, this guy was amazing. Now we're teaching our children about him, but he's gone. And again, like he's one of, as far as we know, two people alongside Professor X uh, who like who knows what Myra's doing. Maybe Apocalypse right. does. You know, it seems like he should, but we don't we haven't seen that interaction. Um, so, again, if you take him off the board like that blows up the Krakoa plant. I think in a lot of ways. So again, I don't want to see it happen because I love Magneto as a character and I love him specifically, like you're saying, getting to see his dream realized uh, potentially of what this nation could be. Plus like Hickman writes villains better than anyone. He writes villains better than he writes heroes. So taking Magneto off the board really limits mm. what he can do potentially, but it would have, I think the biggest impact by far. So we'll see. We'll see. All right, we got a, a super chat here. Thanks so much. This is from Crescent. Thank you for writing in. He says, Mike, has Hickman's run... Oh, has Hickman run inspired any new X-Men-related songs? He says, Iron Hood is a classic. We were talking about that right before we went on, and uh, I agree. What do you think? Is this it, is this integrated into any of uh, what's coming? Not not the new stuff. I have an album coming out um, this Friday, in fact, but it's very much about like my personal life, <laughs> so not a... Not a ton of X Men um, stuff in this one. Although there is a song in there called "Sweatpants Spider Man," but again, that's about me and my life. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so nothing necessarily um, X Men related. Although I have been feeling, I've been feeling a very close connection to the character Darwin. Mm. Um. After, because I, I went back and read Deadly Genesis after House of X Powers Ten, because I I was trying to just catch up on so much X Men stuff that I missed. Sure. Um, so that's a character that I that that really resonates with me, and I'm really interested in what's going on with him and Sync, um, and Laura. And well, um, why does Darwin connect so much with you? Well, his origin. Um, he's like he's like kind of like a like the, the a kid of a of a parent who doesn't care much for him, um, and his and he's you know socially always kind of having to adapt to that. Yeah. Um, and then his power being that he can't die and, and, and the depths of which that's put him and he's tried to commit suicide. And, and then, you know, he's 
he's I don't know I, I feel like he's turned a corner and managed to embrace it and and um, and is really one of the more powerful mutants who they have around there and um, he's a character that just, just I've, I'm really interested in him as a metaphor sure and I want to hear more about him yeah okay cool yeah and he's got a really interesting story right now like you said like he's in the vault with uh, with Laura Wolverine X twenty three and uh, and who's the uh, um Sink and Sink yeah yeah so like and they so, and, so another so another shoe we're waiting to drop yeah a big <laughs> one a big one too yeah. right all that Children of the Vault stuff which I I coming into Ten of Swords I was like maybe that could play a role here maybe there's some connection between the Vault and like uh, Annihilation who's this this wife of Apocalypse character we don't know a lot about uh, but now I'm like I that seems that seems like a reach I don't I don't know if we're gonna get there. Um, but okay, cool. And that's your new album is uh, Anime Trauma Divorce, which is coming. Yes, that, uh, now that drops officially like next week, a few days. This, this upcoming Friday. It's upcoming Friday. It's upcoming right, Friday. Awesome. Yeah. Excited for that. People should check it out. Uh, people can find yeah. that on Bandcamp, and I'm sure all the everything all the streaming places. services, Bandcamps, anywhere where music is still <laughs> offered. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. All right. Thanks for the question. That was awesome. Uh, I see some people chatting about Storm. That is actually the next question. That was one of the most uh, frequent recurring comments here, which was what's coming for Storm's big story in 2021. So the X office has told us that Storm has a huge story coming. And initially everybody's like, oh, sweet, that's going to be Ten of Swords. I dropped some theory videos about how she's going to tie into this event, some ancient ancestors, a shock. If you guys watch that one, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't watch that, you probably have no idea because <laughs> that's a super interesting <laughs> Marvel character. Um, but she's got a big story. And Jordan D. White has since said, like, no, it's not. It's not now. It's coming later. Like, you'll know it when you see it. He was like, it's so big. If you're asking if that's it, it's not it. You'll know it when you see it. So, Mike, after Marauders number 13, which is a really cool storm and in, in T'Challa yeah. issue for, uh, this week, which I'm curious about your thoughts on, um, wh what do you think's coming for Storm? What do you think that big event might be? I mean, this certainly seems to be planting um, the seeds for a big thing with Storm and Wakanda. I mean, I... I this seems like such a huge deal. Like she's made a big public spectacle of stealing this artifact that right. they hold so dear that that she was warned time and time again. If even if we gave this to you, it would cause strife amongst our people. Now she's gone and taken it, and you know I, I don't know publicly how T'Challa will handle having given his blessing at the end. Um, I don't know if he's going to make that public. I don't know if he's going to make it look like she just took it and they couldn't stop her. Right. Um, that seems to have really big implications on the relationship between uh, Black Panther and Wakanda, Storm and Wakanda, and then also Wakanda and Krakoa, uh, which is something that has been teased, of course, since House of X Powers of Ten, that they, um, at the very least, have some, some, some diplomatic tension yes. about them not uh, signing on to the... Uh, to the treaty ratifying Krakoa as a nation and recognizing them as such. Uh, but now this, I mean, this could certainly be seen as an act of war. So to me, an act of war or uh, an, an uh, war occurring between Krakoa and Wakanda with Storm somehow at the middle of that seems like a pretty big deal because that seems like something that becomes a Marvel crossover. That seems like something right. that becomes a Marvel event. Um, so I'm thinking that it probably has something to do with that, especially since we just had the... Uh, Storm's life is on the line, giant size, let's, you know, let's go into the world and save her. Like, I feel like we've seen the, the personal angle with her. Yeah. So the next thing to me seems like it'd be something that's more based on the Marvel Universe and um, and, and having that, that outright conflict between, between Wakanda and Krakoa seems like it's it, it would fit. Yeah, it would make a lot of sense. I, I think you're right. And, and like you said, you know, back in house, they listed the the non-allied nations, and Wakanda was one of them, and not only was it one of them, but it was highlighted in red, right? And we've, we've seen in data pages when stuff's highlighted in red, that means it's a big deal. Something's coming mm -hmm. there that's going to be a bigger story. And Wakanda was different than all those other nations because it just said, we don't need mutant drugs, <laughs> which was awesome. They're like, we're good, we're covered, we don't need this. There might be a little more to it than that, though, which I think we could see explored as well. I, I think to your point, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that Wakanda could cover this up. Like, there's so many witnesses now because you got all these soldiers there. You got Shuri, you got Queen Ramonda, you got T'Challa. Um, my one theory going into 2021 was, like, I thought a storm as Black Panther storyline could oh. be amazing. I oh. thought that could be really cool. Um, it was already kind of full of holes because I don't know. I don't think Wakanda's ever had a non-Wakandan Black Panther, uh, as far as I know. Um, but and Plus, it would have to be, like, 
Ta-Nehisi Coates, if he gets to finish his Black Panther run, which I really hope he does, I'm not sure what the status of that is, like, it's, he's got to either do a death to T'Challa or a, he's somehow in, incapacitated and can't be Black Panther kind of story. Um, I think a death of story arc in, in the wake of Chadwick Boseman's real tragic, you know, passing recently right, would be, right. would be just be a big mistake. I, I don't think they'll go yeah. into that. Um, but I, I thought Storm is Black Panther. That could be amazing. That could be super exciting. That would actually be more of an alliance though. And now after she steals the sword and everybody sees it, I'm like, Ooh, I don't, I don't know how we get there after this. Right. Uh, so I think that's less likely. What I the other theory that I have, aside from the Krakoa Wakanda crossover, which I think is like that would be awesome. I think it's it's very likely, and it would be that sort of Marvel Universe centric thing that they haven't done in the X Office yet. You know, everything is very insular in terms of it's all X Men, right? Mm-hmm. Ten of Swords, it's all X Men. We haven't touched <clears throat> the Avengers. We haven't touched you know that, we have little bits and pieces here, but like the Marvel Universe at large is we haven't done that type of event. A Wakanda War would do that. Um, the other theory I have, though, is Storm is one of very few characters who, as far as we know, has not undergone resurrection. And Giant Size, which you mentioned, made a point of this, right? Giant Size X-Men was like, not only does she not want to undergo resurrection, she is, she is going to fight for it and fight you know, to her dying breath, if it takes it, to go into the vault and, and save herself. She pointedly avoids resurrection, which means that she may have escaped some of the fundamental shifts that people seem to think may be happening when people go through resurrection. So there's a lot of like dark Professor X, dark Moira theories where the, what if people going through resurrection are slightly, they're made more uh, pliant. They're made more accepting of the Krakoan mission. Storm has avoided that. So potentially, and I've seen some people tease this in comments, so I want to give credit where it's due to cracking Krakoa listeners. Um, what if she like uncovers some of these truths? What if she mm. learns a little bit about the nature of Krakoa and then founds her own competing mutant nation. Maybe she takes up head of Arako coming out of the Ten of Swords event. Or we have yes. some sort of Civil War style X-Men uh, where we have yeah. competing factions. It's pretty out there, <clears throat> but it, that is to me is the sort of big type of narrative where you could have like everyone who believes in the Krakoan mission versus everyone who doesn't. Because right now, we're, we're kind of just taking for granted that everyone's on board. Right. It's one of the premises, right? Is like heroes, villains, etc. Whatever your your comic book status was in the past, now you're just mutant, and everyone kind of agrees with that. What happens when people stop agreeing, um, and we and we separate things out? I think that'd be cool. I, th- I think a star yeah. mark there would be would be interesting. That'd be super dope. Yeah. All right. So thanks for the questions on on Storm there, people. Um, let's jump ahead to probably the biggest one, actually. Which is, what do you think the end game is for Xavier and Krakoa? Like, mm. what do you think, what is, where is this going? Um, so, it, it, obviously, this can go in a million directions. But, Mike, what do you think in terms of, like, what do you think their goals are? Are there secrets to this? Are there conspiracies? Do you think it's, you know, what they say it is, et cetera? I, okay, so the most interesting thing that I've reread um like I said, after House X of Powers 10, uh, I got completely electrified and jumped back into X-Men Phantom and went back and tried to read everything. And I've been, you know, doing that all through the course of reading Dawn of X books as well. And one of the most interesting things I read was that that Charles Sewell run on Astonishing X-Men. Mm. Uh, that being the last time that we see Xavier before um, was it House of X number one. Right, um, right. And so there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in that run that oh, yeah. is specifically about Xavier. Um, because apparently this is um, after Xavier dies, and after Red Skull has had his time with Xavier's brain and all of that. Mm-hmm. And Xavier is trapped on the astral plane. And apparently he's been doing battle with Shadow King there for what for him feels to be like a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> And he comes out, and when, when he gets Phantom X's body, which was a, a very weird interaction if you read it. It was very weird. Like, yes. there was not a lot said. And it, it seemed like, you know, uh, Xavier walks him out of the room, and then something weird happens. And the next time we see Xavier, he's got Phantom X's body. And then, right. the, 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 and then he doesn't want to be called Charles after that. He wants to be called X. He feels, like in himself, he feels like something different. And then he keeps talking about giving people these gifts after um 
I believe Psylocke is there. Bishop is there. Is it Iceman? Who, some, is, there's two other X-Men that are there as well. Old Man Logan is there. Yeah. And he keeps talking about giving them gifts. And that, like the very last gift he gives them is to forget that any of this ever happened. Um, and and then there's individual psychic gifts he gives them, and and the interesting connection for me is that when you read House of X number one, and he's when Xavier is addressing the world all at one time, he's talking about, oh, I have these gifts for you, and I previously I would have given them to you for free, mm-hmm. except for all the stuff that's. I'm like, oh, this is interesting because this that character that comes out of that story is weird, right, like right, it is it is overtly strange. And we, I don't know exactly what happened to, to cause him to be that way, but it seems to have continued into um, the dawn of X. And, and to me, I don't know, like that's, that's a really ripe uh, incident to be dug into and figured out, like, what is happening here? Because when you read that, then it's like, no, this isn't regular Xavier. This is not the Xavier we've known. This mm-hmm. is something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, and in his willingness to kind of like, you know, uh, trick people in in subtle ways to to uh to kind of being in alignment with what he's trying to do um you know it, i think it does give us reason to think that he's messed with some of these characters somehow um in the resurrection process or like one of my one of my favorite videos from you to go back to is the one about what had happened between um you know the the last run of x-men we got like that was it a six month gap nine month gap yep <clears throat> something happened there and and I and I think you know uh, the farther we get away from that, uh, it it kind of causes us to forget that that happened. But there's mm-hmm. something that happened in that time that's playing into um, how our mutants are acting and how Xavier is acting. And um, I think there's definitely some big secret there that maybe a storm could discover, or you know, one of our other mutants. Because I think there's other there's also a question of there's a lot of telepaths, right? Uh, like, like, so you, so Monet can't tell that Moira's around, or that Xavier and Magneto are thinking about her. Like, right. that she doesn't pick up on this. Uh, Apocalypse has some, some, um, some, some measure of telepathy. You know, I, I, <clears throat> something else is afoot still. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, one of the more interesting things is figuring out what that is and how long that that's been in effect. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. It, the The Shadow King Professor X stuff, the mist or not Mister X, but the Man Called X. Um, it, to me, it would actually be more disappointing if they never address it now, because mm. there are certain X Men stories where, like, you could see them just being like, eh, "We're just going to kind of ignore that bit of continuity and move on." But like you said, that one is so strange and so recent, and, and just the mm-hmm. fact that it connects to Professor X um, as intensely as it does, it does seem like the sort of thing that. You have to sort of write an answer to that as opposed to, you know, because right now it's all just mystery. And with Shadow King, like, he's a really interesting character in this Dawn of X yeah. because, so he made an appearance. I in, saw uh, that. In Empire X-Men. It, it was a one-panel shot. And now one panel. I, yeah, it was just one panel, and everybody's like, oh, Shadow King's here. This is a big deal. Like, the fact that the dude's even on Krakoa, that means a lot. Um but then he was never seen again. He wasn't seen in the rest of that series. It was almost like the artist drew it in there and the editors missed it, maybe? Something, um, yeah. Or my my theory with that is it was intentional, and they're going to do that every six months and make us think we're going crazy, but it's actually <laughs> going to be the Shadow King just hiding his presence. I think that would be dope. But probably, probably it was a mistake, though. <laughs> and uh, if the Shadow King's around, like, is he even allowed on Krakoa? Because if he is and he's hanging out there... That, to me, says, well, Professor X probably is, he's not connected at this point. Um, if we actually see the two separate from each other. I don't know. There's mm-hmm. there's more to that, but it's definitely a complicated mess. I think some answers yeah. there will be good. I mean, we know that Professor X is out of that body. He's out of Phantom X's clone body, and Phantom X is around, too. So somehow that got reconfigured and, and sorted yeah. out. So they're each in their own respective husk, if you will. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot to answer there. I think too, like with the telepaths and their possibility of knowing, um, their possibility of knowing about what Myra is doing, somehow she's got a block obviously on mutant telepaths. Like we don't, or at least they don't address it, but what she doesn't have is like, we got a lot of time travelers. You got, yeah, cable, you got Bishop around, you got all the other time travel stuff that happens in X-Men. You've got time travelers and, and sort of like, you know, people who can scry the future in the, the non-mutant side of things. 
You know, so th there's this whole like no precogs, you know, no destiny allowed initiative <laughs> because destiny's kind of become, I guess, Moira's like foil. She's kind of like the arch villain. Um, right. But there are other players in the Marvel universe that we don't know what they might think of what's coming, what they might be reading. And again, the time travel thing to me is interesting because it's like, well, if they've seen the futures, how does how does that align with Moira's stuff? I my head just goes, you know, like it just starts like my eyes cross and I forget what I'm even saying when I get into that, but it's a possibility. There's a question too. Um, so they'd say that there's no precogs, but then how do they enforce that? Do like, is there a rule that everybody on Krakoa knows that no precogs and, and they all just agree with that? Or like, or is this another, is this something where, you know, Xavier has flipped some switch um, psychically where nobody's asking about precogs? I think that's an interesting question. Could it be? Could that be part of the subtle shifts in resurrection? Is to to sort of yeah placate asking those questions because right now all we know is that Moira said it to Professor X and Charles mm. in regards to Mystique's request to bring right. it back Destiny, right? So that is not. It's not like it's a law of Krakoa. I mean, they literally only have three laws. <laughs> like it's a very simple <laughs> society. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think like. And there, there are mutants. Um, I think Rachel Summers has some sort of like, you know, kind of like subtle precognitive abilities. There was somebody else I was seeing recently who, oh, is Betsy Braddock actually? Because um, one of the things she can do in the Alan Moore, Alan Davis, Captain Britain run is she can actually uh, see a little bit of precognitive future. It's subtle. It's not. It's not destiny level, but it's it's there, right? So there are mutants who have like pieces of this, and they're not banned. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like that one is very specific to Destiny and maybe Blindfold, sure. who is uh, Ruth, who's a mutant, who um, actually killed herself in the right. Uncanny X-Men run written by Matthew Rosenberg leading up to this. Uh, and she hasn't been seen since either, as far as I'm aware. So those those two, maybe it's just like a certain, like, if their powers are great enough, we won't allow them. Everybody else, like, maybe they just assume they can't be a problem. But then I start to feel like every mutant that's missing in itself is a story, you know, whether that's oh, yeah. Shadow King, whether that's um, whether that's Blindfold. But the big one for me is Legion. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Legion not only not being there, but never being mentioned Yeah, uh, is huge for me. And oh, and there's that one mention, that one mention. Uh, was it Marvel Comics? Was it Incoming? Yes. Where Sinister, Sinister um, yeah. he's going over the Omegas and he gets to Legion and he says... Nobody can find him because nobody knows where to look. Mm -hmm. Like, does that mean that Legion's in a no place? Uh, does Sinister know about all the no places? Does Sinister know everything? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's it, there's a. I, I think I think Legion is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and because I remember sharing with you um, a theory that I had about um, was it is it Age of X? Is that the event? Yeah, the Mike Carey one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, where you know we. we the mutants woke up in a new existence where there's a five that it was very important for their five to be keeping up this wall between the mutants and, um, and, and the humans who are attacking them every day and Magneto's in the white costume. And, uh, there, there were a lot of parallels between like really specific parallels between that event and the reality that the mutants were living in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that time Moira was a really big deal there. Cause she, like, uh, in, legion's mind as he was projecting this event uh, spoilers <laughs> everybody um an aspect of was it his personality took on moira's form and was like the yes. person behind the scenes pulling all the strings yes. there were a lot of really specific um similarities to what life has been like or the events on krakoa have been like and for that to have all resolved itself as legion freaking out and then even when when that was resolved, when we needed to go back to the regular world, Legion just changed it. He he rebuilt the world as he thought it was. There weren't any checks and balances. Yeah. There wasn't yeah. like anything he was comparing it to. So technically, we're all still living in the world as as Legion remembers it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a lot to play with there as well in terms of him being a really powerful mutant who no one has heard from and has the power to be creating some of these inconsistencies that we're we're witnessing in the uh, Krakoa age. And we know that Hickman is a fan of, of that Mike Carey X-Men run, right, where he has mentioned it in interviews being one of the bigger ones um, that he was interested in. There was even in one of the earlier interviews he did with uh, David Harper's off-panel 
podcast, he said he tried to get Mike Carey to write one of the books. And everyone kind of assumes that's the Myra book, which, you know, may, mm-hmm. may not be coming anytime soon. Um, but, you know, like that, yeah, Age of X having an influence, I think, is 100%. That's an interesting theory. That that event reads so intriguingly in retrospect. You know, I think at the time yeah. it kind of it kind of floated <clears throat> by as a, a less necessary X event. But now it's sure. it's super compelling, especially as a part of that carry run, which is which is really underrated. Um, even yeah. now. Very, very good stuff. Uh, so we do have a super chat here from Ma writes, I want to say that I've been getting the maker vibes from Professor X since Dawn and how started with the Cerebro helmet. I mean, definitely that is not an accident. I think that I think it probably has more to do with Hickman's design interests than anything. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's actually going to be. Ult- so the maker is Ultimate Universe Reed Richards. It was a character that Hickman really I, he didn't technically create but basically created in the pages of his ultimates run um and it's the ultimate universe it's he's basically like what if reed richards went bad um and he's really cool now he's in earth 616 donny cates has been using him a lot in the pages of venom uh i don't think it's actually going to have maker connections because he seems pretty busy uh trying to bring the ultimate universe back in venom but again i think that is a design trick just that big helmet can't see their eyes thing he uses that in east to west with the child babylon if you guys have read that image mm. comic series which is well worth it um and uh there was something else too where he used that it's it's kind of like uh the way there's always going to be an all-white character with very subtle black markings like that is yeah that's a hickman thing right he's got one of those mm-hmm. characters in every one of his books black swan throughout avengers new avengers into secret wars um again east of west has literally the character of death is like that so i think it's more style than anything um but I, and he I, also he had also had he, I think he had said that it was that was also about him having Phantom X's body still and wanting to cover up mm. um, Phantom X's face some, and then because he didn't take the helmet off until he had gotten resurrected into his own body again after um, after his murder in right. X Force Number One. That's right, because he he was killed very early in the Dawn of X. So yeah, I think that's all there is to that. Um, I will say here too. As far as like where this thing's going, you know, obviously there's a million directions we could go. I so I pitched a theory how the X Men or how Hickman's X Men will conquer the galaxy. Um, not too long ago, I'd recommend people check out that video because it sort of lays out my how I think the X Men are forming alliances in space and in the Marvel Cosmic side of things that are going to pit them against the Avengers and their alliances. So post Empire, basically, you have uh, Avengers, Skrull, Kree on one side, and then you have X Men, Shi'ar. Um, the Brood, and possibly some others. On another side, I think that's definitely going to ha- come to a head at some point. I think the X-Men's long game is cosmic. And again, like that is the that is the fun thing for me about all this is, yes, it's it's a slow burn, and, and man, do we need some revelations, but also like the long game is the most interesting part here. Because how they actually establish like, security on Earth, which has kind of been... It's like we take that for granted. You know, It's like that's the, the X-Men story we kind of know is them fighting that battle. Now, it's still interesting because we've never really seen them win. You know, we've never right. really seen them kind of have the success that they're having at this stage. Um, but I think they're thinking even further because of what Myra has taught them, which is like, yeah, cool, once we do that on Earth, there are still going to be all these threats on a cosmic right. scale. So we need to, like, figure out mutant survival forever. Like, the plan is not, like, mutant survival for 100 years. It's forever, um, which is much, much harder, obviously. This is what ties into me, one of the more interesting theories that I've been batting around. I don't know how much there is to this, but I've suggested and I've seen it suggested that like one of Mara's plans could be to sacrifice uh, mutants and Krakoa to the phalanx, that they could look to ascend via you know, whatever the heck is going on there with all that powers of 10 stuff that was laid out, and to achieve this ascension for their survival. What I'm thinking now, though, is what if she's actually fighting against that? Because in Mara's Life 6... We saw her make it that far into the future where there was right. that society that was like, hey, we want to ascend to the phalanx, whatever that means, right? Basically, we want to be subsumed by this entity and live forever, kind of under their one hive mind type thing. And what if instead of that, we know one of the things that the phalanx fears is the phoenix. Moira could potentially be seeking to bond with the phoenix as a resurrection for her 11th life. So we know she has mm-hmm. 10 lives. This is the final life, and Destiny told her it's your final one unless you make the right decision so there's something she has to do to get to a life 11 um i Mm. think ultimately like all of this is there has to be us going to a life 11 i think if the if the story ended with hickman saying 
Moira, you made the wrong choice. <laughs> no Life 11. <laughs> that would be very huh. disappointing. <laughs> so I think. I mean, it's, it, it certainly would be, especially because she's, you know, in a no place. Like, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Like, the, safe, the safest place she could be where nothing could happen. Like, you know, she'd have to have some big reason to come out of that to be killed, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, totally. And a lot of people were joking when we finally saw her with the Cerebral Helmet fritzed out. In X Factor number two, they're like, what? What is Myra actually doing? Like, what is she? Yeah, what, what does she, she do, do all day? day? <laughs> what does she do all day? Like, I remember, was it in, at the end of House X Powers of Ten, where like they brought her to some tea, and she was saying she could just go get some yeah. whenever she wanted or something? So what is she? So she's got a she's got a gate in the no place, she's and she just gate. goes wherever she wants. She's got a gate to go get tea. We know that much, but other than other than tea retrieval, I have no idea. Maybe she has like ten gates, and they go to all her yeah. favorite spots. I don't know, just all her. Favorite but again, spots. like. That also, like, if, if, if you're Moira and you know that there's all sorts of um, telepaths around the Marvel Universe, maybe you don't want to step out for tea. Like, maybe that's kind of a risk. Yeah, I don't know. Right. No, just her being out there is a risk. But she's got to be she's got to be doing things. I mean, she's not she's not the type of character after what we learned about her to be like, OK, I've given you the plan. Now you guys go do it. And plus, we know, too, like she doesn't really trust. Professor True. X and Magneto. You know, she she doubts because yes. they brought in Mister Sinister, and that was against mm -hmm. her wishes. She was like that, and they're idea. and they're messing with Mystique about bringing Destiny back right. when, you know, she, she doesn't want them to do that. But she won't. They won't tell Mystique they won't do that, which she knows is going to cause some problems. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So my my tentative theory there is like, what if she's planning some sort of scheme? where the Phoenix is actually involved in her resurrection into Life 11. We know the Phoenix is one of the things that Phalanx fears. I haven't put it all together. I don't have it all together. Yeah. We, know the, we know the Phoenix is coming in a, an Avengers event, um, I think towards the end of this year, in the Jason Aaron Avengers, yeah. which right now is like totally separate from what's happening on the Hickman side of things. But Hickman and Aaron have been working together for over a decade as far as like being Marvel guys. Um, they have a relationship. They kind of know each other. So I, could there be some crossover there? It's a possibility. Throwing it out there. All right. Um, oh, I would throw out here, too, a little a little support for that is in the Claremont Cochran burn era uh, leading up to Dark Phoenix, Moira is the, the person, the scientist, who is experimenting on Jean uh, when she's uh. going Dark Phoenix. So she could be the one getting some readings, getting infor information that she is then going to use. There is a little historical background for that as well. All right. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay, what do we got? We got, let's see, it's been almost an hour now. Thanks, everybody, who's joined us and had an awesome conversation here. Uh, I really appreciate you guys checking this out. Again, this is the 100th issue of, of episode of Cracking Krakoa. I never thought I would get um, this many, frankly. I kind of just started doing it, and it picked up. So I appreciate that you guys have all supported this and, and dug it um, as I've been having fun theorizing and talking X-Men because definitely this is the most excited I've been about X-Men in a long time. Mike, what's your... Uh, I didn't ask you up front. Like, what's your your X Men hotspot? Like, when did you really get into the franchise? Uh, well, um, the first wave. Um, whew, uh, I think the first X Men book I ever like really remember buying and reading was like X Men two eighty. It was um, it was a uh, Mirror Island saga. Oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think Professor X like was l losing the use of his legs again, fighting the Shadow King. Mm -hmm. um, and so they into the '90s era, of course, um, with X Men number one and X Force and all of that stuff. Uh, and then I rocked with it really hard up and through um, Age of Apocalypse. And then I didn't like I didn't like the onslaught stuff. Yeah. So like I didn't really I I really didn't dip back into X Men after that until damn near Avengers versus X Men. Oh, okay. Um, but then I you know I. It was also just me kind of like being a young adult and, you know, dating. Like, I didn't have, like people, people move on, you know, like, I, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, I, but I, I came, I, I've always wanted to come back. Honestly, the, one of the big things that had made it hard for me to come back was that when I used to want to know what was going on with comics, I pick up a wizard. Mm, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, like, that was the main way I would just kind of understand what was going on with storylines and not having that for the past decade or whatever is it had made it really tough i would i would you know like i bought a lot of avengers versus x-men but there was so much of the utopian stuff that i didn't know right. about so it, it some of it didn't make any sense for me um and uh it wasn't really until house of x powers of 10 where i was like okay this is the kind of reset i needed yeah. and 
I just loved the writing for that so much that I ended up just going back and trying to read every good X-Men story um, since. So I've read, at at this point, I've read everything from Grant Morrison's new X-Men. I think I've gotten as far as Wolverine and the X-Men, and I didn't haven't finished that nice. yet. But nice. just just about everything in that in that decade. Yeah, so you're all in on catching up. It's a fun journey, I, I think, to kind of the way you can catch up now, where you can do everything at once. You know, is yep. is pretty entertaining, especially with Marvel Limited and stuff like that. It makes it so easy or easier to do mm-hmm. so. Um, I've actually got a bunch of I, my comic shop has a bunch of old wizards like from the '90s, and they sell them for like a quarter. So I was I've been grabbing a bunch of those not too in the not too um, distant past, and like it, it's kind of fascinating to go back and just like because I, I missed out on that era as far as like being a comics fan and having this like this testament, you know, this one thing about, like, here's what's hot, here's what's going on. It's it's really interesting to see, like, how comics was... Because now it's so spread out, right? There's a million YouTube yeah. channels, there's a million blogs, there's a million everything. Um, but, you know, kind of have that one consolidated, like... Here's it, it, was, it was centralized, and this is where you went to get uh, your, your, you know, to stay in tune with storylines, but also to see how much your million-dollar comics were worth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and the toys, and then, you, and then, you know, you'd also find out about the business, and... You know, it wasn't even just Marvel DC Image. It's Valiant. It's Malibu. Like that whole thing. It was. It was in the '90s. It was. It was a really interesting thing to be into because you had so many ways to be into it, and you could follow along with it. And I felt like I was growing up with the comic book business at that mm. time. And Wizard was like a really important part yeah. of that. Yeah, it's interesting. Very cool. All right, so let's uh, let's look at a handful of other questions. If you're still good on time, Mike. Do you have Do you have a hard stop? Sure, sure. No. Um, all right, so Fernando asks via YouTube, uh, the fact that there's a possibility that Absalon and Mad Jim Jaspers have their own kingdoms that they rule in Otherworld makes me think that if Saturnine is still an antagonist to the mutants, uh, which is likely, there's a chance that there will be some sort of alliance between Monarch, so that is uh, Jamie Braddock, Absalon Mercator, and Mad Jim Jaspers against her uh, to dethrone Otherworld. They could form some sort of quiet council of their own or a triumvirate of Omega-level mutants for other world, I wanted to share this because this is a really cool theory. Uh, so thanks, Fernando, for sharing that. Uh, it is fascinating the mutants that we have in other world. Um, I, Mike, for your for where you're at as an X Men fan, is all of this building out of other world and these characters like how does that connect with you? Are you like, do you care? Is uh, it, it weird? It, like, where does that fit? I like, haven't, I haven't, and 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 it's been entertaining because I, I like so many other writers. Um, and they're making the connections for me with Apocalypse and, and his children, and they're making it all make sense. Uh, but it does all feel very new to me. I don't know about Mr. M. Um, I don't know about Mad Jim Jaspers. I never read a lot of the uh, the old Excalibur stuff. Right. So a lot of a lot of those those names just don't really ring bells for me. Um, you know, I, I I have always heard of Mr. M and Mad Jim Jasper at very powerful mutants. Right. So I'm excited to to meet these characters because I would be meeting them, but I don't have any uh, prior experience with them that makes me like emotionally excited about right. them. Right, it's they're very obscure. I mean, they, even for me, like they're extremely obscure. I mean, Mad Jim Jasper's biggest run is that Alan Moore and Alan Davis one I keep talking about, but that's like borderline impossible to read legally. <laughs> like it's so hard mm. to actually get your hands on that thing. I paid like, you know, like ten times the asking price, like the retail price, just to get a paperback copy like a number of years ago. Um, I literally tried to down before I did that. I tried to pirate it. I'll admit it. it I'm, I'm ashamed, but I'll admit it. I tried to pirate. I tried to pirate it, <laughs> it happens, and it, it, happens, it like broke yeah. my computer. It like broke my laptop. Wow! <laughs> that was like one of the few and last times I tried to pirate a comic because it it was like you paid the ultimate I did, price. I did. Yeah, the the karma gods mm-hmm. got me on that one. It was like your uh your 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 cerebro helmet fridged out because you were trying to. <laughs> download a, a comic from other world exactly. you know exactly that's totally yeah. what happened um and then i bought it the right way and and now i just enjoy it like a, a good comic fan should but uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no they're they're really obscure reference mr m's been in like i don't know like four comics like basically he's been in that district x series um but yeah but the thing they all have in common is they're all insanely powerful and they all can like warp reality to some extent and yeah. i will say i saw a question here in the chat so imagine jaspers yeah he is a mutant um, or at least he defines himself that way in that Moore and uh, and what do you call it, Alan Davis run. Um, but he's also like from another reality, and maybe he exists in our reality. I don't. He's he's not listed on the Omega level chart of mutants um, in Hickman's run, but he's like the way he's been used in the past. He's 
as powerful as any of the Omega levels that we've seen, like Jamie Braddock mm-hmm. or uh, Absalom Mercator. So could he fit with them? Absolutely. If we have three Omega level reality warpers in Otherworld all aligned with mutant kind of some sort, I think that's completely fascinating. And like, again, I think Jamie Braddock is the one here to really keep an eye on because Teeny Howard put him in Excalibur for a reason. Like Apocalypse right. puts him on the throne with some intent and we have not seen much from him at all you know so i think jamie's gonna have a if he doesn't have a big role to play in the story i'll be a little disappointed i suppose um because he's too powerful to have as a part of this other world connection as we're now like basically hickman and howard they're they're making other world their own thing you know other world right. historically has just been like this king arthur arthurian you know landscape of camelot and this this british fanciful like fantasy world they're making it totally their own thing we got 10 courts we're explaining what all those are potentially we have an omega level mutant leading one of them although i maintain that like literally calling it mercator but keeping mystery about whether or not it's mr m to me which that's his last name um makes me think well maybe it is somebody else because that's Mm. almost too easy of a connection Uh, but but sometimes they do that you know like remember the, the um what was it? The uh, the Red King fiasco. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, you know, sometimes they just they they, they give a soft ball. Right. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes <laughs> it just is what it says on the tin. Um, so, yeah, great question. I think that'll be super interesting. Uh, let's also look. So what do you think? Do you think Moira in her ninth life, she went to uh, Araka, we assume, and got Apocalypse, Apocalypse's children with him or his first horseman? Like we see that on the timeline. She's like rescued the horseman. Mm-hmm. Now they're going through this game again. In Life 10, it's the whole premise of Ten of Swords. Do you think that Moira is helping them? Do you think that she, like, because she must know how to do it because uh, she did it before. So yeah. why is she involved? I I, I really, I, I've been meaning to go back to that uh, issue in House X Powers of Ten where they where they do lay out the timelines and, and where it states that. Because I, I, I want to get a better handle on that because I don't, since she does know, it would makes sense especially because the the entire thing here is taking enormous risk to make sure a mutant survives so if there if there's this epic battle that could mean mutants lose the power of resurrection and get wiped out one would think that she would lend her expertise um i just i i don't know like does she have a way to get in touch with xavier she must, she must <laughs> like, right? Yeah. You know, it's got to be something, right? You send him, send him nine one one on a pager. I don't know how she does it, but like, yeah. so, somehow or, or another, there has to be some way where she can communicate um, with them, and then, and then they they have to be letting her know that this is going on. Um, but you know, when Apocalypse comes and tells the council, like they're all very surprised. Right. right. You know, so it doesn't seem like Moira's uh, really kept them up to speed with what Apocalypse could be doing at any given mm-hmm. time. So I don't really know what the play is there either. Yeah, that to me is all very interesting because if her her goals are to get them to certain points, like Moira knows certain critical junctures and certain things that will repeat, and she wants to prepare them in such a way that they can enact her final plan, whatever that is, right? She wants to get them to whatever that point is. Um, it's possible... That having gone through this before, Myra could be like, I need you all to go through this again the same way without insight because things will happen here that will help. That are important. Yeah, they're important and they will help me in some way, right? Whether it's maybe Apocalypse can't fully give in to their cause until he sees his children and wife, you know, manipulated. Or maybe they need to go through this so that they can come out of it and actually form an alliance with Arako. Right, something like that. Um, it, it could make sense because otherwise, it's like she's literally been there. We think, um, why would she not give them the insights to make sure that you know, for example, per the the first part of this conversation, Magneto doesn't die or or whatever, or maybe that's important. Maybe she wants that to happen, and that's actually a good thing for her, right? So like, there's there's got to be some scheming and some knowledge level there that Moira is is making sure happens because otherwise, like. The fact that she has all this insight is not being put to use, and that kind of defeats the, exactly. the way this character's built she, up. She did seem shocked when that helmet went on the fridge, though. She didn't <laughs> seem like she was expecting that to happen. So, I, I would know. love the animated cut of that of that scene of her just you know <laughs> reading a book and just <laughs> you know, throwing it. Out the <laughs> all right, good deal. So, okay, we're coming up on an hour plus here. I think we've had a really good conversation. Again, thanks so much to everybody who um who has joined up in the chat who has supported crack and code to this point mike thanks so much for your time 
hopping on and of talking course. to me. This was this was yeah, fun man. talking. My my pleasure, yeah. dude. You're, you're doing a great. You do a great service here, Thank man. You. I'm 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 happy to uh, happy to Thanks, join. Man. So what else? So what else do you have for everybody listening? What else do you have coming up that you want people to know about? We know we got anime trauma and divorce coming new, out, but uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's this Friday. Um, I got a podcast network with a bunch of stuff on there, including what had happened was with Prince Paul. I got a new season of what had happened was with a new guest. I'm excited to announce um, oh, very awesome. soon. Nice. Yeah, I've, um, been, I've been loving that podcast so much. So I. I check out every episode and then i i go and i listen to like that discography of all the things yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's the fun thing because like i knew day law right like I'd, I'd done that you know and i do that somewhat regularly but i i had never listened to like grave diggers i had never listened to um prince paul solo stuff um the, the what is it prince of, not prince of cats that's a graphic novel prince among prince thieves, among thieves. Thieves. or uh that yeah, album yeah. Blew me away. that album blew me away yeah it's yeah. incredible it's an incredible piece yeah. of work you know, so that that's been super fun to do as well. So people should definitely check. Yeah, it out. man. And and uh, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm announcing a new uh, season with a new guest who I think will equally be exciting. And that's that's news I'll be announcing soon nice. as well. Nice. All right. Very cool. I'm I'm excited to check that out. Um, and again, people can check out Anime Trauma and Divorce and should because it's gonna be it's gonna be good stuff. So good luck with the release, man. I appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch with with X Men theories and uh, and comments here. Absolutely, <laughs> I'll be in that inbox before you know it. <laughs> awesome! Uh, thanks so much for everybody for listening. Again, I will try to I will scan through some of your comments and questions here and uh, look for ideas to try to address in future Crack and Krakoa stuff. Otherwise, you can find me. I'm Dave. You can find me at Comic Book Herald or ComicBookHerald.com for just about anything. Um, yeah, and let's keep talking comics and uh, and staying positive about X Men. So thanks everybody. And enjoy the comics.